It's um some time. Hey guys, um some uh. has cracked many jokes in this uh. video. Do let us know your favorite ones. Also, there's a quiz at the end of this video. Don't miss it. Hey guys, have you met Bosco? If we had to introduce him, how would we do it? Hmm. <laughs> Not in dog language, um some. We would say Bosco lives in house number nine, barks only at 2 p.m., and absolutely loves to sleep. Similarly, what is Carbon's identity? Probably an mm. element that has atomic number six present in the second row of the periodic table. Hmm, boring. What is Carbon here for? What is the importance of its existence? Do we need to summon Professor X for the answer? Mm. <laughs> We literally would not be able to exist without carbon. It is that important. It is known to be present in some form or the other in every known life form on Earth. How? We all are made up of cells. Cells contain molecules, which contain atoms. Carbon is one such type of atom, but it comes in different shapes and forms. Ever been to the beach? Beach? Did I hear beach? Surfing time! Hold on, um some. Almost everything that you see there, the rocks, the shells, even the ocean, contains carbon. Even a tennis racket, the lead of your pencil, your favorite fizzy drink, or even a sparkly diamond, they all have carbon. Looks like almost everything seems to either contain carbon or needs carbon to survive. But then, if carbon is so super high-level important, won't it get all used up? That's where nature steps in and saves all of us. It is constantly recycling carbon so that we don't run out. Just like a spinning wheel, carbon is also constantly circulating between living and non-living things. The cycle is called the carbon cycle. Now, we can further divide this cycle into the biological carbon cycle and the geological carbon cycle. The biological cycle can span from a few days to thousands of years, while the geological cycle can go on for millions of years. Let's first talk about the biological carbon cycle. The cycle starts with the autotrophs. Who are they? The cool guys who can make their food. Plants. Oh. Can you make your own food, um some? Well, I can order my food all by myself. Does that count? Ugh. Forget it. The cycle begins with the process of photosynthesis in plants. To make their own food, hmm? plants need carbon. Oh. This carbon is present in the air in the form ah. of carbon dioxide. During photosynthesis, hmm. in the presence of sunlight, ah. plants take in carbon dioxide. This carbon dioxide is then converted into glucose molecules. This is what the chemical Shh. equation looks like. Now, when we get a week's supply of food home, do we eat it up all at once? Hmm. No. We eat some, we store some, right? Hmm. Similarly, the glucose formed is used up by the plant for its activities or stored for future use. Now, what about us or even dogs, tigers, etc.? None oh. of us can make our own food, so we either ah. eat plants or other animals to survive. We are the heterotrophs. Oh. Who am I then? I only need burgers to survive. <laughs> Anyways, when animals eat plants, the carbon content in the plants is transferred to them. Now, some animals like lions, tigers, etc. do not eat plants. But they do eat the plant-eating animals, right? When that happens, the carbon content enters their bodies as well. In this way, carbon enters all of us through the food chain. Now, time for the second half of the biological carbon cycle. As the sun rises every day, it also has to set. Similarly, the carbon that comes in has to oh. go out. But how? Should I use a vacuum cleaner to suck the carbon out? No. Oh. When plants and animals mm. respire, they release this carbon content into the atmosphere. How does that happen? When plants or animals need energy, they break down the carbon-containing glucose molecules through a process called cellular respiration. Just like we convert sugar to sugar syrup, this breakdown converts the trapped carbon into carbon dioxide, which is then released back into the atmosphere. This is the chemical equation of respiration. Oh. 
Also, when plants and animals die, they start to decay. Decomposers act on the dead organic matter, releasing carbon dioxide. Thus, the carbon content that was taken in by the organisms is released back into the atmosphere, marking the end of one biological carbon cycle. Yay! Carbon's going back to his mommy! Oh, I'm some. <laughs> Only you can say something like that. Now, let's talk about the other type of carbon cycle, the geological one. In geological carbon cycle, carbon circulates between air, water, rock, soil through processes like weathering, sedimentation, subduction, volcanic eruptions, etc. Let's dial down a little bit and understand step by step. Hmm. In the atmosphere, when carbon dioxide dissolves in raindrops, it forms weak carbonic acid. This acidic rainwater, on reaching the Earth's surface, slowly starts causing the weathering of the rocks, forming carbonate compounds. Now, due to erosion, these carbonates are washed into the oceans. Then, they get deposited and start settling at the bottom of the ocean. Over time, just like a stack of pancakes, several layers of sediment accumulate on the sea floor. When conditions are suitable, large deposits of this sediment convert into rocks like limestone. Formation of such limestone rocks isolate or sequester carbon for millions of years in the Earth's crust. This process of capturing and storing carbon is termed as carbon sequestration, and the natural reservoirs like limestone rocks that store carbon are called carbon sinks. Now, when one tectonic plate of the Earth moves beneath another, the limestone rocks are pushed deeper into the Earth. This process is called subduction. What happens if we heat ice? It melts, right? Similarly, within the Earth, heat and pressure cause the limestone rocks to melt, releasing carbon dioxide from the rocks. Through volcanic eruptions, this carbon dioxide is released back into the atmosphere, completing the geological cycle. Besides this, due to human activity, a lot of additional carbon dioxide is being emitted into the atmosphere. How? Millions of years ago, many plant and animal remains containing carbon got buried deep into the soil. Just like I bury my secret treasure. <laughs> Stop it, um some. Within the Earth, these remains were subjected to extreme temperature and pressure for millions of years. Eventually, they got converted into fossil fuels such as coal, natural gas, oil, etc. Now, for most of our activities, like cooking, driving, etc., we use these fossil fuels, releasing the stored carbon back into the atmosphere. Ah, that's what I've been saying all along. Stop cooking. Start ordering. <laughs> Stop it, um-sum. Such human activities are affecting the carbon cycle. Due to industrial revolution, the demand for fossil fuels has risen globally. Just like eating food happens much faster than cooking it, fossil fuels are being used up much faster than they can be naturally formed. Also, as burning of fossil fuels releases carbon dioxide, it has led to elevated levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We know that plants absorb carbon dioxide and help in maintaining the carbon dioxide balance. Large-scale deforestation has thus contributed to the increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide. So, overall, nature has devised a great system of recycling carbon in the atmosphere. Whether biologically through plants and animals or geologically through limestone and weathering, it is now our responsibility to maintain hmm. it. Which organisms release carbon from dead things into the atmosphere? Heterotrophs, autotrophs, decomposers, producers. Come on, guys. Clock is ticking. Start typing your answers in the comments section. The correct answer is option number three. Decomposers. Ready for the second one? Here we go. When carbon is captured and stored for many years, the process is called carbon subduction, carbon sequestration, weathering, cellular respiration. And your time has begun. Think fast and write your answer or correct option in the comment section. The correct answer is option number two, carbon sequestration. Last question, guys. Good luck. Which process does not release carbon into the atmosphere? Photosynthesis, volcanic eruptions, 
weathering cellular respiration. And your time has begun. The correct answer is option number one, photosynthesis. <laughs> How do antiperspirants work? They work overtime and don't even take incentives. No. Huh? A type of sweat gland called apocrine oh. gland produces sweat which has fats and proteins. Bacteria on our skin eat these fats and proteins and produce bad odors. Oh, the odor is really gross. Hence, huh? to mask the odors, we use deodorants or antiperspirants. Deodorants make the environment too acidic or too salty for the bacteria to thrive, thus preventing the production of odors. On the other hand, antiperspirants enter the tube through oh. which the sweat comes onto the skin and form a gel-like substance. <laughs> this gel blocks the tube, preventing the sweat from coming onto the skin. Uh -huh. If there is no sweat for the bacteria to eat, then there will be no odor. Uh -huh. However, according to experts, some deodorants and antiperspirants contain toxic oh. components. Hence, we should avoid their excess usage. <laughs> Arg! Now, just wait and watch. I'm coming. I'm coming. It's pointless. No matter how hard I try, the great gravitational force will never let it happen. We are all governed by an invisible force of attraction called gravitational force. It helps us walk on the ground and ensures that what goes up ultimately comes down. Go away. Go away. Why don't you leave me alone? <laughs> That's because it's my brother, Shadow. Whether we are standing out in the sun or next to a light source, our body does not let any light pass through us. Nah, 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 nah. So what happens? A dark patch forms in the area where the light does not reach. The dark patch is called a shadow. What if shadows disappear? Doesn't matter. Amsum was never really afraid of shadows. Uh, huh? Firstly, if shadows disappeared, uh, huh? makers of horror movies will be severely disappointed. They will have to think of new ideas of scaring people. Hmm. Secondly, if shadows disappeared, huh? people may start missing shadows so much that they may start <laughs> looking for old pictures or videos wherein shadows were still visible. Hmm. Thirdly, if shadows disappeared, solar or lunar eclipse will not occur anymore. Stars and planets will get extremely confused. Hmm. hmm. Fourthly, humans as well as animals usually rest under a tree in order to escape from oh. sun's blistering heat. Hmm. If shadows disappear, it will not be oh. easy to avoid sun's heat anymore. Hmm. Lastly, if shadows disappeared, science teachers huh? may have to remove this topic. History teachers may include it in their teaching. Hmm. Hmm. Huh? <laughs> topic. Nuclear fusion. Huh? Why is nuclear fusion not used uh -huh. to generate electricity? Hmm. You really want to know the answer hmm? to this. Right? <laughs> but wait. Before answering the question, hmm. let us understand what is meant by nuclear fusion. Huh? When two huh? lighter nuclei combine to no. form a heavy huh? nucleus, a large amount of energy huh? is released. Huh? This process is hmm? called nuclear fusion. Oh. Hmm? Where does this nuclear fusion take place? You think huh? that it takes place in a laboratory? <laughs> No, you are absolutely wrong. Nuclear fusion takes place in the sun. The nuclei of two hydrogen atoms join together to form a heavy nucleus of helium with the release of a large amount of energy. How do you think this energy reaches us? Ah. <laughs> nah, it does huh? not reach us through power oh. lines. Wait, I will tell mm. you. 
The energy huh? released after nuclear fusion reaches us in the form of sunlight, ultraviolet radiations, heat, etc. Oh. Huh? Hey, but we're already producing electricity oh. with the help of nuclear fission. So, why do we require nuclear fusion? For this, you need to first understand the difference between nuclear fusion and nuclear fission. As we already know, nuclear fusion is the fusion of two lighter nuclei with the release of a large amount of energy. The exact opposite process happens in nuclear fission. Here, a heavier nucleus splits into two lighter nuclei releasing a large amount of energy. Uh -huh. This process of fission is used in nuclear power plants, where a heavy nucleus of uranium is split into lighter nuclei. The energy that is released in this is used to generate electricity. Oh. However, there is a major disadvantage of huh? nuclear fission. Oh. Wondering what it is? Mm. Oh. The major disadvantage uh -huh. is that uranium is a radioactive element. Oh. When uranium mm. undergoes oh. fission, it generates radioactive waste along with energy. This radioactive waste is very harmful for most life forms and the environment. Hence, we need to find a clean and safe source of energy to generate electricity. What source would that be? Would it be nuclear fusion? Bingo, Hooray! you are right. Huh? Then huh? why are we not harnessing mm? the energy of nuclear fusion to produce mm. electricity? This huh? is because for nuclear fusion, oh. two conditions are required. Oh! They huh? are high pressure and high temperature. Huh? Only when these huh? conditions are met oh. can the two nuclei travel at very high huh? speeds resulting in collision. Mm. Huh? On mm? Earth, it is extremely difficult to create such high pressure and temperature. Even if we are somehow able to create these conditions, the question is how will we control them? As there are many questions unanswered and unsolved, we have not yet succeeded in using nuclear fusion in the production of electricity. What is a cataract? It may be a cat's nickname. No. Hey! A cataract is an oh. eye disease. How does it form? Wait, I'll explain. Hmm. Each of our eyes consists of a transparent lens. Is it similar to my camera lens? <laughs> Absolutely. Mm -hmm. huh? Our eye lens is made up of water and protein. They are arranged in such a way that keeps the lens oh. clear and lets light pass through it. Hence, <laughs> a sharp image is formed on the retina. Hmm. However, as we age, the protein begins to clump together, making the lens cloudy. Oh. This clouding of our eye's natural lens is called a cataract. In huh? such situations, when light from an object enters our oh. eye, the clumped protein blocks or scatters the light. As a result, a blurred image is formed on the retina, thus making it hard to see. Hmm. How are smartphones changing us? Ha! <laughs> No one can change the one and only umsum. Yeah, yeah, you huh? show off. <laughs> Bending and staring down at our phones for several hours increases the stress on our neck and spine, leading to neck and back pain. Experts refer to this condition as text neck, and it can eventually lead to serious consequences. Also, at night, when we stare at our smartphones, the light emitted from their screens makes our brain think it is still daytime. So, our brain oh. does not produce the sleep hormone melatonin, causing us to stay awake for long hours and thus, disturbing our circadian rhythm which regulates our everyday bodily functions. This can lead to obesity, diabetes, cancer, etc. An interesting fact is that smartphone addiction has given rise to a new phobia called nomophobia, short for no mobile phone phobia. It is basically the fear or anxiety of being without our phone. 